Hey everyone. Uh, ooh, hot mic. Uh, I'm Alex. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, I really like JQ Khan and thank you Adam uh, and yay jQuery. So uh, my talk's uh, a little bit about jQuery, uh, a little bit not. Um, uh, in that you use jQuery to build front-end apps, uh, and jQuery is pretty good at security vulnerabilities and closing them. So uh, these aren't problems in jQuery, they're problems uh, in the apps that uh, you build. Uh, so I work at Stripe. Uh, I think I have some show notes. This might be easier. Here we go. Uh, I work at Stripe. Uh, we do payments on the web. One more. Slip some behind the scenes action right there. Uh, so I work at Stripe, uh, we do payments. Uh, they're in California, so uh, I get to come here a lot. Uh, San Francisco is a little colder than San Diego. Um, it's great weather here. If you're from here, good choice on living. Uh, but uh, I live in Texas um, where uh, it was like a, I believe it froze over like three days ago and it was 84 today, so that's pretty normal. Uh, Texas had a lot, lot of nicknames. Uh, we'll go with uh, the Lone Star State. The, the web has a lot in common with Texas though. Uh, it's also called the Wild West. Um, uh, the Wild West, uh, uh, I can't remember who said it, but th there's a good quote about uh, the web being the Wild West because there are no rules, there are no governments owning it. Uh, and uh, anyone who's malicious uh, has the same rights as you. Uh, so back to Texas, uh, in 1985, Texas had a problem. Uh, they probably had like a lot of problems in 1985, but specifically, uh, we'll talk about uh, littering. Uh, Texas asked their constituents, hey, could you not litter? Uh, they said, uh, we have a God-given right to litter, which is so, like, I just like thinking, like, I can't put myself in the shoes of someone uh, that's saying that, but uh, whatever. Uh, that's my, uh, so there were fines for littering that, that they started. I'm sure those had been around for a while, but uh, you know, they, they bumped them up and put up signs and tried to scare people into, into not littering. Uh, but no one seemed to care. Littering didn't change at all after spending you know, a few million dollars on trying to raise awareness for this problem. They tried some new state slogans, uh, namely, keep Texas beautiful. Uh, and it invokes images of like old ladies walking down the block saying pretty please, bringing you a plate of cookies, asking you not to litter, and, and uh, it wasn't terribly effective. Uh, they didn't resonate with the core offenders of the littering policy. It wasn't the people who respond to keep Texas beautiful that were the ones throwing litter on the ground. Uh, namely, these were males, 18 to 24, uh, like in the documents of the state when they were trying to figure this stuff out, the Department of Transportation, they literally used the term bubba's in pickup trucks, uh, which I, I really like. In my show notes, I wrote gun toting, rootin' tootin', prideful folk, uh, which I just like to say. Uh, uh, so in 1985, uh, Mike Blair and Tim McClure at GDSNM, GSDNM, that's so hard to say every time. It's a very famous ad agency that did like Mercedes or some, some German car company. Uh, so they, they did an ad uh, with uh, the Texas Department of Transportation called Don't Mess With Texas. And so you may know the phrase Don't Mess With Texas because they say it during football games and on TV and in movies and stuff like that now. Uh, but this is a littering campaign uh, and over the course uh, of four years, uh, it reduced littering 72% uh, on Texas highways. And what they did was they appealed to the Bubba's and pickup trucks and said, this is Texas, we're prideful, uh, and uh, we keep what we have nice. Uh, and they hit their core audience, and they're able to make this massive change just by like uh, addressing the core audience. So it was a pretty uh, huge advertising win. But, but more importantly, they were able to take a, a bad problem uh, and essentially put the same amount of money and the same amount of uh, effort behind it and massively change it uh, just based on the messaging. So my point is, uh, hey everyone, you should make your websites more secure because it's really important probably isn't going to do the trick the same as Keep Texas Beautifulism. Uh, it doesn't resonate with web developers, uh, it resonates with security researchers. Uh, I would also like to note that don't mess with XSS. 
I'll let, uh, you can laugh more if you want. Um, uh, also probably won't work. So web developers, not security researchers, are the core audience uh, of web security. Security researchers, those extra ER, uh, aren't working at your company probably. There's a few. I know and yet like has a whole section of their company that just uh, does security research uh, and audits all their apps for them. But uh, for the most part, we're at agencies and small product companies. Um, and we don't have someone kind of keeping an eye on this thing. So it needs to resonate with us, the people actually doing the web development and not the community that's really into like uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, web security isn't easy, uh, especially <laughs> compared to uh, not littering. So I think we have a, a, bigger, a bigger path to, to walk. Mountain to climb, whatever. Uh, so all you have to do is uh, never make a single mistake, says uh, Mike West, I think, from the last time I see him talk, saw him talk. Uh, and that, that's pretty true. Uh, all you have to do is you sit down, you program, and don't ever write any bugs, and always keep uh, up to date, and you should be fine. Um, I think uh, he also quoted uh, Alex Russell. He said, I discount the probability of perfection. Uh, and that's, uh, if you know Alex Russell, pretty much the sums up uh, his <laughs> outlook on many things. Uh, but uh, Mike West also said that uh, we all have deadlines, right? So we can't be everywhere at once. We can't know everything. Uh, we're trying to build a website. And so we can't always uh, be on top of the latest security stuff. Uh, so almost all security problems come from something called content injection. There are other like protocol and uh, crypto cryptographic problems that we have in security. But from your standpoint, if you're not doing ops work, for the most part, you want to be focused on content injection. Uh, so if you run completely static websites, uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about a lot of this stuff. But uh, I take it that probably most of you uh, don't do that full time. Uh, so content injection is this. Uh, you have a template. This one is handlebars. Uh, and you want to output some items that you have in your data. Uh, and then you have some content in that item, and uh, you, you, you print it out in between those li tags. Uh, and now imagine this was your data. Uh, so you have a data with some items. Uh, someone was very mean to you. Uh, and then you print out the script tag into that li, and then whenever you render the page, the script tag fires and an alert happens. Uh, so this is bad. Uh, you generally have to opt in to this behavior in many modern uh, thing, many modern template languages and frameworks, but you'd be surprised how easy it is to not realize that some layer down you've opted out and you didn't realize you were supposed to escape things correctly. So here you can see we're using the triple brackets in order to put that content in. That's how you say don't escape my HTML. Otherwise it'll take our angle brackets and escape them correctly and that's good for content injection or bad for if you want to succeed in content injection. So uh, this is me. Uh, this is the username I pick at AustinJS whenever anyone does a real-time chat demo. Um, and it's the first message that I type. Uh, and that's pretty fun. Uh, and for the most part, uh, people uh, generally still fall for a lot of this stuff. I think the biggest thing, I don't it's not even in my slides, but uh, don't use HTML, uh, like the HTML function on jQuery to uh, put like text and stuff on a page uh, that's user input, always use text and it'll escape for you. I just realized that that's what it, you need to know for that. Uh, user agent, this is a user agent. Uh, you have one, it gets sent to the server every time you make a request. Uh, and some websites uh, like to print that back out for you uh, for various different reasons. Uh, a lot of web development sites will tell you what user agent you are or whatever. Uh, this is mine. Uh, it's pretty normal. Normal in the sense that everyone has one. Crazy in the sense that, what the hell is that? Um, but this is my friend Mike Taylor's user agent, which seems pretty much the same at first. Um, but if you look closely, uh, I don't know, like there's this small like subsection of websites that is just like, well, we'll see if it works. Uh, I, I just like that. Oh, there's my. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, Sammy Kamkar, I don't actually know how to say his last name. Um, in 2005, uh, he did the Sammy computer worm. And that's a pretty scary word that you hear in uh, 
CIS something and C I don't know. Uh, but computer worms uh, actually just mean that it replicates itself. Uh, and in this case, all it is is some simple content injection. So all Sammy did on MySpace uh, was said that if you visit my profile, uh, I will run some scripts uh, via, he, he used this crazy hack where he split up the script tag into two parts. And so all of the checks for script tags didn't catch because it saw like SCR and IPT, it never saw a script fully together, uh, which is a, you know, groundbreaking hack. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, so he did that, he was able to execute arbitrary code and he was able to put that on his wall and then whenever it ran, what it would do is it would post the same thing on that person's wall and it would friend him and it would post Sammy is my hero which is a, a nice side effect. So all he did was he wrote something that uh, friended him, wrote Sammy is my hero, and then did the same thing on that person's uh, you know, message area. And so what it did is it spread like wildfire. In the first like 24 hours, he had like 60 million uh, friends. And he was like Tom and then him, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and so it was, it was very simple content injection. I don't think it took him very long to do. Uh, it was just a, a very simple vulnerability. I was reading through the Wikipedia page here, which probably isn't very easy to read. You can, you can hit it. Um, it uh, he got arrested and indicted under the USA Patriot Act uh, for releasing the worm. And then uh, he pled uh, to a felony charge and then was sentenced to three years probation without computer use. Uh, so don't concatenate uh, script tags together um, is, is the model there. He's actually back. Um, he, he took his three years off. I imagine uh, he must have got some time in because he's still pretty on top of his game. First thing he released when he's back that I know of uh, is Evercookie. Evercookie is uh, kind of a wrapper around uh, local storage or cookies uh, or flash cookies or silverlight cookies or CSS history or uh, e-tags or uh, window.name or user data storage in IE, session storage, local storage, global storage, database storage, SQLite, uh, Google Gears, I think. He used a Java exploit in a common version of Java on XP uh, to write data directly to your hard drive. Uh, <laughs> Nifty. Uh, that API is still coming. A file uh, and Canvas. You can store data in canvases. Uh, so he used every possible way of persisting data, and he would write your data to all of them at once. And you'd be like, "Oh, let me clear my cookies real fast," and you would still have all of that data backed up in 19 other locations. Pretty nifty if you're an ad agency. Uh, uh, or you know, like an ad network trying to track some people across. And ad networks loved Evercookie. Uh, if you look into the fact, uh, he has a privacy concern, which is interesting. Like, oh, privacy concern. Uh, everything about this. Uh, how do I stop websites from, uh, from doing this? Uh, he said, so far I found that using private browsing in Safari only will stop uh, all Evercookie as long as you do a restart afterwards. Um, so pretty much you have to just format your hard drive. Uh, <laughs> simple. So let's detect malicious scripts. Uh, we know MySpace was pretty bad at it. They couldn't detect someone catting together some strings. Um, so let's look into maybe some simple scripts uh, to see how we might be able to detect whether they're doing something uh, malicious or not. Uh, for instance, this uh, simple one-liner. Uh, this is valid JavaScript code. Uh, anyone want to read that for me? Uh, tell me what it outputs. That's alert one. Pretty interesting. Uh, so <laughs> that's an example to say that you will never, ever, ever be able to detect malicious code and you should stop. Uh, I think a lot of the old Windows uh, virus stuff would have like signatures of what applications would do and that's what would uh, kind of trigger the Norton antivirus uh, alerts or whatever. Um, I think the same is true. You never could do this, but it's not a sufficient mechanism to try to detect whether someone's doing evals or something by just looking for the word eval. Uh, another pretty cool one uh, and the ultimate uh, dis against detecting scripts uh, is this uh, very, very cool um, attack. Uh, you can see it in its full glory here. 
2010, Billy Hoffman uh, gave a talk at JSConf that you can see online. He goes by Zoomf. He mostly talks about performance, but uh, he did a lot of uh, security research back in the day. Uh, and he gave a pretty uh, good example of this. Uh, there's the malicious code right in between those script tags. Uh, you might recognize those as tabs and spaces uh, just in a row. Uh, and then he decodes those as ones and zeros. And then you can you know, pull ASCII out of there and uh, uh, execute it as JavaScript uh, somewhere else. So uh, unless you're in the business of uh, trying to find significant white space in JavaScript, uh, which, um, sure, do it. Uh, let me know. So I, I say you cannot detect malicious code. Uh, you obviously can detect uh, malicious code, but you can't detect it every time. Uh, so this is what a lot of people try to do. Uh, yeah, just uh, take all the script tags and replace them with nothing, and everything will be fine. Uh, even if this was true, which it's not, we've already seen that it's not, um, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, let's say you're, you're a user who's uh, I, I don't understand the people who run no script. I can't imagine the web working well with it on. Um, but let's say you're even crazier and you just disable JavaScript in your browser. They still let you do that. I, th I think Firefox doesn't let you anymore. Maybe they do again in dev tools, but not in the regular settings. I don't care. Uh, let's say you were able to do it. Let's go to CSS hacks. Uh, JavaScript is not the only place. It's the obvious answer to where hacks can occur, but by no means is it the, uh, the entire uh, uh, target area or, or vector of attack. Uh, there's uh, DOM APIs and uh, lots of cool CSS stuff. The, the most popular one is the link history uh, leak. Uh, there is a uh, visited pseudo selector, uh, so you can style links that you visited to be purple and links that uh, you have it to be blue, and that way the user can see what they visited. And it's nice, and it's been on the web forever. Uh, so if you want to know anywhere that someone's been, you add a link to the page, check to see if it's purple or blue, and now you know that they visited a, a scary website that you don't want to know about, .com, or .expert, or whatever the cool new uh, TLDs are. Um, there's an expert TLD, there's a ninja TLD, and there's a coffee TLD. I try to get script.coffee, um, and it was already taken. Anyways. Uh, this one is mostly actually uh, pretty solved. Uh, I believe uh, David Barron, maybe? Yeah, David Barron uh, did a lot of work with Mozilla and like, the, the security community in order to like, come up with a way to essentially just lie. Uh, we'll still allow you to, uh, to style links differently, but when you check to see what color they are, we're going to tell you they're blue uh, pretty much all the time. So uh, that's an interesting fact is try to find the link color uh, for the visited pseudo selector. It would be pretty difficult. Um, it seems like it wouldn't really work. Uh, you might say, like, well, there's a lot of websites on the internet and they all have, you know, fancy weird stuff at the end. Uh, you can inject a lot of links into the page. Um, and uh, there's, there's a white paper I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, and what they did is they did this neat thing. They, they had, uh, you know, common search terms for uh, maybe like uh, cancer treatment or uh, symptoms of cancer and, you know, something your healthcare provider uh, might want to know. Uh, prior to uh, giving you a quote online. And what they did is they uh, binary searched the domains. Uh, so they load in sections and run it. Uh, and in about like uh, a minute and a half, they were able to go over like uh, millions and millions of URLs and find out most of your history. You'd be surprised how few iterations of the Google uh, um, you know, extra params that there are. Uh, so it's totally possible. Computers are pretty fast. Uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty scary, but luckily, newer browsers are not so susceptible to this. Um, so pretty much uh, the, the get computed style of both now uh, is, is the same. Uh, so this is where we get to timing attacks. Timing attacks are pretty interesting. Uh, they are old. They're old attacks. It's like one of the first vulnerabilities in, in Linux or Unix or, or something is a timing attack. And, and what it generally is is like you have a password. Uh, and you want to get your password, uh, uh, you want to give your password and you want to get access to something, right? Uh, and you have password failures to say this password is invalid. And so if your password is 1234 and you send it in, uh, it'll take time to validate that the one matches the one that they store, the two matches the two that they store, the three matches the three that they store, and the four matches the four. Uh, but if you send in maybe uh, five, six, seven, eight, immediately, uh, 
it's going to say the five didn't match the one, so we don't have to actually check these other numbers. And so uh, as a person who's uh, trying to hit this endpoint, you can say, well, that felt, failed really fast. So I know that that character was wrong. And as soon as it takes a little longer to fail, you know you got the first character right. Uh, and then when it takes a little longer to fail, you got the next character right. So you can essentially just keep hitting these endpoints uh, and eventually figure out the whole password. And so it's critical that backend services that do uh, validation like this uh, always check everything. Even if every single one is wrong, you always have to do the same exact set of operations uh, for incorrect passwords as you do for correct ones, uh, which is uh, super interesting to me. Uh, hashing gets around some of that, so this is not necessarily, plain text passwords don't do that. Um, but anyways, um, on the web, timing attacks have not really been very feasible, uh, mostly because we have really shitty timers. Uh, we have set timeout and, uh, and set interval, and they're really bad. You're like, uh, give me set uh, timeout 10, and like a minute later it'll call back. Uh, our set interval will like be calling out of order and backwards and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, I call that security by inaccuracy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I think I coined that. Uh, anyways, uh, we have good timers now. Uh, request animation frame, uh, it was very hard to write animations with bad timers. And so we we're like, oh, let's add a good timer for animation. Um, and so we added request animation frame, uh, and it's pretty solid. It tries to hit 60 frames a second, 16 milliseconds, uh, uh, more or less on the dot. It, it's, it can be a little off depending on what you're running and how blocking your code is. So uh, when you have the visited pseudo selector and request animation frame, uh, maybe now uh, you can have timing attacks again. So what's the vulnerability here? The visited link is blurred, and the regular link is not. Uh, trick is that if you look closely, my Facebook password is actually the shadow around the visited link. And that's just, uh, that's not, uh, that'd, be, that'd be crazy. That'd be a very bad, I don't know. Uh, what it is is uh, the link on the left takes less than 16 milliseconds to render, and the link on the right takes uh, sometimes greater than 60 milliseconds to render. So we're back to the same thing. We know exactly which one uh, is fast and exactly which one is slow, and so we know which ones are visited and which ones are not. Uh, luckily, this is much, much slower than just checking for purple or blue, and so it takes quite a bit longer to find these, but it's still like in two years, uh, that, that'll be the same again. Uh, so this is pretty, pretty scary stuff, um, because the only solution is to slow down the one on the left to the same speed as the one on the right. So I'm not sure this will go away. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can maybe randomize some things, make it harder to do. Um, but I, I don't know the solution to this. Uh, we'll move on. I guess I told you there was not too much JavaScript left, but I lied a little. JSON P. Uh, it's called JSON with padding. I, I know, actually, I'm interested. Who says JSON? All right, and then JSON. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the JSON people are always more opinionated. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, well, and I am one. Uh, it's actually been solved. Uh, Doug Crockford coined the term uh, JavaScript object notation, uh, and I believe at uh, a talk a few years ago, he, he uh, resolved it as uh, JSON, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so JSONP is JSON with padding. Uh, more or less, uh, what that is is uh, you inject a, inject a script tag, and the script tag can run, and you send it a callback, right? So a lot of times when you need to get data cross domain, which has all those restrictions for AJAX, uh, you want to use JSONP. Uh, I like to call it JSON pretty insecure, uh, because it is. Uh, you might tell yourself one day, I'd really like it if someone could run arbitrary dynamic scripts on my page. Uh, uh, and then you'd be a JSON P user. Uh, so so you, you wouldn't do this. Uh, I like this because it reminds me of the ads, like you wouldn't download a car. Uh, but uh, so script SRC and you, you, you add hacks.com and send like some geolocation information. And it's like, why would you do that like that? You just let them execute a script on your page. Just go get the data from them. Uh, and uh, this is exactly the same thing. So uh, all that JSONP does whenever you're using JSONP and jQuery AJAX is it puts a script tag on the page, gives it a callback, it writes JavaScript that calls a global function and passes you data. Uh, so it could do this as well. Could uh, 
go ahead and grab the social security number on your page, uh, make a request back to your server, uh, their server, um, and log that, and then go ahead and even give you your data for you, uh, because they wouldn't want you to notice uh, for as long as possible. Uh, so, so this would be bad, and this is totally possible, and if you're using JSONP, you're vulnerable to any vulnerabilities that your third-party providers are vulnerable to, uh, and that's, that's scary. Uh, now, uh, generally, you have to still put third-party code on your site, uh, and I write a lot of it, so keep doing it. Uh, so uh, one way to, to get around this is, uh, uh, it's not a real Tumblr, uh, is to use cores. Um, the way you do that in, uh, in jQuery is with the XHR fields if you want to use uh, post and uh, put, I believe, um, or options. Uh, I can't remember the ones that J the XHR supports. But a few more methods other than just get. Otherwise, you can just do cross domain true. And that'll send the uh, access control headers. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into that. Um, Pretty much it sets up headers. Both websites have to whitelist to say, he can talk to me over cross domain, and they can send me data across domain, and we're all cool with it. Uh, and that's much more safe, because you're getting you know, text, uh, and then you can parse it with JSON and uh, actually uh, not allow arbitrary scripts to run. Good resource on this is enable cores. Uh, so uh, if you want to check out more information about using cores, which you should do, uh, check out that. Um, Next is cross-site request forgery. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to necessarily protect your website, uh, but more or less, uh, if you have a form on your web page, it probably hits an endpoint, uh, and you post to that endpoint. Uh, well, in someone else's web page, they can set the uh, place where a form posts to to anywhere on the internet. Uh, so if you're on hacks.com, they can post to jquery.com slash donate uh, the form. Uh, and they can post data to that. So we want to protect against anyone else posting data to our forms while still allowing our users to. And what we do is we give them a cookie and say, here's this special token only you have, and then we also put it in the form. And then whenever that gets submitted, uh, those, should, those two should match. So if you're on a different website, uh, you're on hack.com, you don't have a cookie anymore, and so whenever you post the form, only the form might have you know, a random uh, CSRF token. Uh, but uh, probably not one that matches your cookie, which doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, that's pretty good protection against knowing who's posting from where uh, on your website. But uh, it'd be really nifty if uh, a website could figure out those tokens uh, and then use them against you. Uh, so here's a form with a CSRF token. You know, you hide it, and then when you submit the form, it goes through. Uh, uh, and you might have a value there. And that's a pretty crappy value because it's not very long, easy to hack. But uh, I'm going to keep going with that. Uh, anyways, uh, let's say someone was able to get CSS into your website, uh, and they use one of these attribute selectors to say, if there's a CSRF value uh, with uh, 001, put the background image of it to be this PNG that probably doesn't exist even. Uh, but you'll have a log in your system that this selector hit, which means that that really was the CSRF, and now it logged to a totally different server that has no cross-domain checks because resources in CSS uh, are uh, totally allowed to be cross-domain. And so maybe you generate a couple of these, uh, maybe more than a couple of these, uh, and try a bunch of different values. Um, this gzips really, really well, so it's actually pretty easy to get in. Um, so it gets worse. Th this is the context is white paper. I think I've been saying contextus, uh, and then I realized that that wasn't true. Um, this is some pretty scary cool stuff uh, that I won't tell you how it works at all. Pretty much uh, there's some SVG filters over cross-domain stuff. It looks like this. Uh, they take a cross-domain, fully cross-domain website, they put it in iframe, uh, and then they're able to run SVG filters against it to pull out contrast, and then they can use like OCR technology to figure out words uh, in the page. And that's pretty difficult uh, uh, to know like what fonts they're going to use and where they're going to put things on the page and what's an image. Uh, so what they do is they actually use the view source URL. Um, you know, view source colon that, and they know exactly the font that Firefox uses to render view source pages, and all the HTML's in there just the same. So they can OCR it all out line by line. Uh, takes a pretty long time, and it's pretty processor intensive, but in, you know, a year this could be pretty bad. I, I imagine Firefox and stuff will fix it before it's really real. So, uh, so we need a new approach. Uh, I'm dangerously low on time, so I may go a little quick. Um, 
content security policy is, uh, is, is kind of the first step uh, in solving a lot of this stuff. It's this header that you send along with uh, your HTML pages and resources and things like that. Uh, and uh, you get to tell it which uh, URLs can uh, execute code or CSS or load images or be in iframes or uh, do XHR requests or uh, anything like that. And you can also report back uh, on whenever anyone breaks this stuff. So by default, it disallows inline JSS, JSS, JS and CSS. Uh, and uh, it doesn't even let you like put a script tag in the page with JavaScript in it. It's, it's too dangerous. That opens you up to many vulnerabilities of, of inline JavaScript. Uh, it doesn't let you do uh, eval either. You can turn these on with unsafe eval and unsafe inline. Uh, you can disallow cross domain, all that stuff. You can report the violations uh, to this stuff. Uh, and the key is that it's a whitelist. Um, and so you now have control over the entire set of things that can execute code on your website. And you no longer have to keep in your head the entire world of security. Uh, you can focus on the few things that you're working on. Uh, goes beyond content injection. I'm actually going to use HTTPS. Uh, don't be, uh, don't get click jacked. Uh, and, and this is kind of a security by default. Um, and uh, I think someone from OWASP would like stage tackle me if they were here. Uh, there's no such thing as security by default. But this is a, a step in the right direction. Whitelisting is the way forward uh, when it comes to web security because there are too many crazy hacks uh, that occur otherwise. Uh, so you can rely a little less on the probability of being perfect, uh, but we need to buy in. Uh, so we need everyone to get excited about web security um, and take pride. So I, I'm going to propose don't mess with the web, uh, which is not much better than my original XSS joke. Uh, but either way, we can kind of do something about it together. So talk to me, write blogs, fix your website, um, put it on HTTPS only, redirect the, the, this core site, and then fix all these little bugs, and then write a blog post about it, and make it cool uh, to care about security. Uh, I think if there's ever a time, at least in, in the States, that people like, might have a glimmer of uh, interest in security. Like, th it's this year. Um, so, so get on it. Thanks.